Sit down, please. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm sorry for disrupting your discussion. I will see how to mitigate and uh, not really pay for it, <laughs> but something in between. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Um, my name is Kithura Kindiki. I'm the Deputy President of the Republic. And thank you for clarifying, uh, Madam President. Um, please, that uh, there is no um, tension uh, between uh, the Deputy President of the Republic and the President of the Guild. <laughs> President remains president, isn't it? <laughs> so all protocols observed. <laughs> I'm delighted to officiate uh, this uh, convention, the sixth, the seventh of this kind. This conference of this convention brings together media representatives of government like myself, academia, civil society, technology companies, and all of us are here to define the future landscape of journalism in our nation. This rich mix of participants here today is an important ingredient in offering a holistic approach to the issues of discussion during this convention. The media, is a powerful instrument for advocacy and education of the masses. With its tentacles in almost every home state, the media shapes not only the opinions, but also the beliefs of citizens. Through <coughs> its print, audio, and visual platforms, the media remains a leading source of information for the masses. With the advent of vernacular radio and television, and television stations, Kenyans of all walks of life can now access critical information at the comfort of their homes and in their languages. We have moved from the one television, one radio station <coughs> era to a, an era of a myriad of choices, including a new world of social media and artificial intelligence. These changes have had a big as these changes have had as big an impact on the media sector as it has had on all other segments of our society. Today, media houses are struggling to compete with non-traditional peers where integrity and standards cannot be assured. The transition to digital platforms has meant a reorientation and a recalibration, often time at great cost. It is not lost on all of us that the evolution of a technologically driven world order now has the media fraternity as one of its many victims, if not casualty. The advent of the internet and the rapid growth of digital technology have rev revolutionized how we consume information and entertainment. It is therefore imperative that we all adapt or perish. The need for media actors to innovate is now. You must embrace digital platforms, diversify your content, and build on collaborations and partnerships outside the beaten path. Ladies and gentlemen, the relationship between government and the media has often been strained and marked by distrust, tension, and adversarial interactions. The media has been cited for advancing political and partisan interests sometimes at the expense of its core mandate of being the public watchdog. It has been blamed, maybe fairly, maybe unfairly, for the deterioration of public values through the glorification of immorality, vanity, and morbidity in pursuit, in pursuit of the almighty shilling. 
On the other hand, government has been accused of frustrating the media due to its public publicization and profiling of EUs in society. Government has been accused of seeking to control coverage through coercion and intimidation. Government has been accused of failing to protect media freedom and the personal safety of journalists. We must bridge this divide and build a working partnership grounded on accountability and responsibility. Both the media and government are charged with great responsibility, great power, great influence. And whoever is entrusted with great power and great influence must, and I say must, be subjected to great accountability. To whom much is given, much is required. It is not in doubt, perhaps, from where I stand, that government appreciates the role of the media as a watchdog in society and will continue to support the sector to effectively perform its role of shaping public discourse. Through educating the public on current affairs, exposing malpractices, and holding government agencies and officials to account, the media contributes to the safeguarding of the tenets of our national values and principles of governance, which are espoused in Article 10 of our Constitution. However, the exercise of media freedom as guaranteed by the Constitution should be of necessity be tampered with a sense of responsibility, as I have said, and accountability. It is more common today to find single perspectives barely tempered by a right of reply about perceived government action or inaction. Indeed, it is not uncommon to see small insert apologies, often a few days after a sensational story has been published, seeking to apologize and clarify positions. And only after a victim has, been, has called the media out for its misreporting, by which time the credibility of the victim is in shambles. Journalists must uphold a high level of professionalism that is founded on professional standards. I am aware that the Kenya Editors Guild, as the professional association for editors in Kenya, is dedicated to promoting media professionalism and credibility. I call on you to do more. The, professional, the profession is expected to candidly critique and point out areas where the government can do better. As you do so, it is equally important to spotlight the reforms, initiatives, programs that occasionally government implements, sometimes without a lot of fanfare, to improve the lives of Kenyans. In other words, paint a comprehensive picture for the people of Kenya, both the good and what you think could be done better. Government does not ask to be favored. We do not request to be favored. No, we ask and indeed expect impartiality in your reporting where you present all the facts and cover all sides of a story. Fair reporting, in a sense, should mean not reporting what cannot be verified. Reporting must not be aimed at tarnishing people or institutions' reputations. Just a few reflections. We have been asking ourselves, for example, those of us who are privileged to serve in government at this time, could, for example, the new healthcare system, the Taifa Care, could it provide a silver lining, if not for any other reason, in its ability to perform data analytics for the first time so that we can identify and plan for the most common diseases affecting Kenyans today? Isn't the affordable housing program 
inadvertently providing avenues for our young Tibet students to undertake industrial training and for everyday masons, welders, and carpenters to become experiential teachers to these young minds. What is really so different about the new university funding model from the old help application process that required a letter from the chief? And so on and so forth. And what we are saying here is that uh, government, like any other human endeavor, is not perfect. But I'm sure there are things, there are programs, there are policies, there are initiatives that are for the interest of our country and that promote the public interest. And I think it is only fair, even as corrective reporting is done on the imperfections of some of the programs. It is only fair that those uh, highlights of uh, what is working also find their space in your reporting. I saw yesterday, I think, His Excellency, the President launched the, uh, well, it's not really launching, but just uh, gave the status of where we are on um, enhancing transparency in the e-citizen endeavor. And he did report how government revenue that hitherto used to be pilfered, used to be mismanaged as exponentially, exponentially increased because of the transparency measures that have been put in place through the digitization of government services. Tremendous leaps and tremendous uh, savings have been done. Money which ordinarily would be stolen, pilfered, and misappropriated by people who are using manual methods of collection. In the fight of against corruption, which I think remains one of the most consequential fights that this country must sustain, to be able to survive in the long run, for the country to survive in the long run. I would have thought that, for example, the measures taken by the government to increase transparency and track the money that the government collects from the people of Kenya is a bold step towards enhancing uh, transparency and improving the fight against corruption. Because that way, the next thing now to be asked or we should be asking is how that money is being used for the benefit of the people of Kenya. Therefore, I call upon media to ensure factual reporting built on credibility and concrete conceptualization of issues. We should be devoid of biases and interests that often trigger sensational communication. It is time we are scale to fact-based, accountable, and honest reporting. I urge the fraternity to upscale its efforts to in the prevention and fight against corruption, as you've said yourselves, not only within government, but also within private sector and all sectors, including your own sector. This corruption is a national cancer. It, um, it permeates very many sectors, and that fight, I think, we should all uh, gang up together uh, in solidarity and save our country from the cancer of uh, corrupt practices. And therefore, um, we need to stand in different places to see the issues properly. And I therefore urge you to embrace a multifaceted lens in reporting so that you are the victim, the perpetrator, you are the arbitrator, and you are the spectator before you make a conclusion so that you know, as media actors, you frame the public mind properly. I invite the Editors Guild to remain available and to receive uh, support of any kind from government in the things that we do, the regulatory framework, in the things we do, in the policy framework. Because as I've said, like any human endeavor, Government as a human enterprise and as a human endeavor is not perfect because it keeps on improving and learning all the time. So I want to 
encourage you to, to avail yourselves for consultations, collaboration, and constructive criticisms. And I like what uh, the speakers who spoke here earlier on, the president, the CEO, and of um, the Media Council and the, and the president of the forum. There are so many presidents around. <laughs> 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 so, um, of the African Forum, uh, Oga, <laughs> we, 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 we hope we can collaborate and see how we, we learn from each other, improve on what is available, and make sure that we build our country. I like what has been said about uh, one, we don't need to agree. It's not even in the interest of the country that all of us agree. We need alternative voices. We need a plurality of opinion and voices. What we must guard against is um, disagreeing in a manner that jeopardizes our broad national interest. We should not, for example, disagree violently and use violence on each other. Therefore, Madam President, I know you, it's fine, you don't have to stand. I know it is, uh, I know the, that clip you showed here was deliberately prepared. <laughs> <laughs> and the message, the message is home. The message is home. And I better say no more, because uh, other than the current role, you know I am the immediate security minister of the country. So some of the things you're seeing, I'm familiar with them. You are familiar with them. Maybe because we were in different positions and roles, I could have a perspective that you may not have. But I also admit there are perspectives from your side that we could not have as government. So the thin balance, therefore, of how we articulate our differences of opinion and different positions in the transaction of our national life, whether politics, business, professions, we must make sure that in, that, in those transactions we don't hurt our national interests, especially the existential foundational uh, circumstances that assure the last, the long term sustainability of our country. Now, you know, the balances between freedom of expression, assembly, picketing, media freedom, access to information. On the one hand, heavy protections, quite um, um, elaborate protections in our Bill of Rights. How do we balance that with public safety and make sure that the constitutional order is not overturned by extreme expression of democratic ideals? And those balances are in the Constitution. We don't have to go very far we'll find them there. And only hold each other to account when either of us is on the fringes of those balances. That is my plea. You know, our friends in the US had a democratic stress test, like the one we had in June in this country. I would not call them protests, I would call them a democratic stress test. Because the tensions between the liberties of the citizen, which are immutable and entrenched, and the survival of our constitutional institutions, that uh, delicate balance is something we will, we will have to navigate going forward. Uh, I don't want to raise issues which are not for this forum. But I've been wondering, as a citizen of Kenya, and as a leader, and a, a member of this administration, 
we are guaranteed our freedoms in very absolute ways, sure. But I thought the same constitution has also asked us to preserve the nation and preserve the constitutional order and its institutions. I thought so. I thought so. If that be the case, for example, if, for example, through popular consensus, and I'm saying this is hypothetical, it did, it did not happen, but if by popular consensus we generate adequate public consensus to do away with some of the institutions of governance completely, and we can go all the way into doing a referendum to validate it, because that is the absolute way of, of uh, democratic expression. We decide, the people of Kenya are sovereign, it is true. They exercise their sovereignty either directly or indirectly, directly through the organs that are established in the constitution like parliament, legislature, executive, but directly through elections and referenda. If we all decide, for example, through a popular consensus that we build public consensus that we don't need some of the institutions that are established under the Constitution. It is popular, it, the, it is in the public interest, but I don't know whether it is in the national interest, for example, hypothetically, to abolish the judiciary. Because you can do that in a referendum. You can do that in the referendum. The people have decided we just need two arms of government, for example, we don't need uh, a, a meth, uh, uh, an arm of government that deals with disputes between citizens and among each other, or between citizens and those who are responsible for running government institutions. So it's food for thought. And I know, I believe, and I, I really hope I'll be invited again, because these are things I would want us to spend a bit of time informally discussing. Informally, it costs nothing to exchange views. And you don't have to take my views. I also don't have to take all your views. Yeah? But because this is a formal process, I will leave it there and say the following things that are relevant as I close to this forum and the issues that have been raised, including the clip that was showed carefully. <laughs> and strategically. First, my sister here, the, our cabinet secretary for ICT, is one of your own. It's one of your own. Of your own. She is, yes, a member of government um, and, and so forth, but professionally, she's one of your own. I am a member of government. But professionally, I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. I am a member of the legal profession. Okay? That is a lifelong uh, badge of honor I, we all carry, you know? So I see no reason why we should not have avenues for talking to each other. I see no reason. I, I just gave uh, Margaret as an example. She's a professional from your own circles. In the office, all the offices, including the office of the president, the office of the deputy president, one, some of you people are there. I'm seeing one seated in front of me. Who works in my office? Francis is known to many of you here. So I don't see why, for example, even outside the formal avenues, why some things should bother us so much, because the minister, for example, being one of you, is somebody who can reach using your professional channels and maybe bring to her attention some of the things that she could um, have uh, either forgotten or perhaps um, uh, not appropriately balanced with other things as she runs that ministry. Therefore, we agree with you fully on the strengthening of KBC as a public broadcaster. We equally 
agree with you fully and unequivocally on the need for us as a country governed by the rule of law and a constitutional order. We should respect court orders and what the courts have said about the relationship between the Media Council of Kenya and the Communications Authority. There should be no doubt or debate because we are a country run by the rule of law. There could be interpretational issues and so forth, but that is a discussion we can have. Uh, but I think there is no uh, there is no nothing to negotiate around that space. On the safety of journalists, we agree. For the reasons which I have said in my formal remarks, we agree that the safety of journalists is, is critical. We believe in the freedom of the media. We endeavor to protect it. Our constitution has guaranteed these freedoms. And you expect in any society, occasionally there will be infractions. The problem is when we do not address those infractions as we are required. And therefore, I want to commit for the journalist who was uh, hurt, um, here in this city, uh, that is quite unfortunate. And normally when um, an event like that happens, there are two ways of dealing with it. One is through the internal police, um, uh, internal affairs uh, police uh, unit, but also more objectively through the IPOA, the Independent Police Oversight Authority. Now we've had a leadership transition in the last three months. We have a new IPOA coming on board, uh, I think uh, any time from now, they'll be sworn in, parliament has approved the names. So, and the other one had, I think, given an exit report. So we, we these things happened at a time when there was a leadership co uh, transition. So I will be following up on where we are, and I want to undertake, uh, Madam President and the rest of the colleagues here, that we are going to follow up to ensure justice is done and establish who did this and bring that person to account. Because as I said, the balances are clear. The Constitution allows the use of firearms by persons allowed by law to protect 99% of law-abiding citizens against potentially 1% who want to hurt the rest. The law allows. But the same law does not permit a police officer or an official of the security forces to use their firearms to hurt people outside the constitution and outside the law. And therefore, I want to undertake that we will follow through, especially now with the, the new IPOA uh, commission, uh, to make sure that uh, full justice is served. On the question of um, the board at the Media Council of Kenya, I am told in the next two or three weeks, the minister has told me we are finalizing the completion of uh, population of that uh, board so that uh, we don't have uh, governance gaps in the industry. The same applies to the Media Complaints Commission. I have noted and I'll follow up. On the issue of advertising, I totally agree with you that advertising budget should not be constrained because of differences on the kind of publicity government is getting. And uh, even when government is aggrieved by bad reporting, because there are also infractions from your side once in a while, just the same way there could be infractions from those of us who are in, uh, in the government side. So we will be starting a conversation on how we discuss among government. I know some of it is ongoing, especially on the question of uh, pending, uh, pending bills, which have really made some of the media houses to, to really have to struggle for services they have rendered. But as you're aware, pending bills are a general challenge in our economy. 
But on this one, I followed up before I came here, and I was, uh, I have, uh, I can commit that we are doing all we can to clear in its entirety the portfolio of the pending bills in the media industry to make sure that government doesn't uh, b paralyze the operations of, uh, of uh, media uh, outlets. There is also the issue of um, advertising and other things, and then uh, restrictive advertising, and, um, and also the need for a media uh, center I have, uh, ta and tax reliefs. We have captured that. So I would propose that both using the formal and informal channels, we can be able to, I've already given you already, in my office, Francis works for government of Kenya and is with me all the time. So if we wait for the normal government procedures for a matter, matters that are urgent to, to, be, to, to be brought to my office, it may take time. But if you reach out to Francis, there's nothing wrong with that. We have this, inform the deputy president, we have this issue, it's a faster way. The minister here is you one of your own, you can reach out to her, even directly. And I think for me, those are, that's the best way to handle some of these things. Um, yeah, and, and it doesn't compromise anything. We still are who we are, uh, and we respect each other's space. Um, then I, as I end, you have raised two uh, very important things, uh, Madam President and the other speakers. I have spoken to one of them, and that is the need to fight corruption and the need for accountability by government to make sure that public resources are not stolen, they are not diverted, and they don't uh, benefit private people because that's unlawful and unconstitutional. That's one of the, them. You did hear the president of the State of the Nation address. He made it very clear that we, we must heavy lift the country must heavily lift on the fight against corruption. We cannot, we cannot sustain this country like this anymore. Something has to give way. The same way we've made difficult economic decisions in the economy, and that's why there has been a bit of uh, unease, because some of them, uh, some of these decisions have their side effects, uh, uh, especially at the initial stages we must also heavy lift on the fight against corruption. Using the hard ways, like the ones I said, uh, you know, jailing people and, and so forth. But also I also mentioned about soft ways. How, for example, using technology, we have reduced the number of characters who are diverting public funds. And if we put that, that project into 100%, collect traffic fines and everything digitally, we would have saved a lot. And then, of course, we start now asking, how are we spending this money? And that's a conversation we must engage in. But the second and last uh, grave matter that you've raised, and we concur uh, uh, entirely, is the issue of what climate change portends for Kenya. I am glad you took initiative to develop a manual and build capacity for, elder, uh, for journalists and, and editors to be able to transact with this very complex and uh, quite frightening phenomena that is changing the DNA of the world. His Excellency the President has provided political and diplomatic leadership on climate change diplomacy globally, leading to the hosting of the African Crime, uh, Climate Summit in Nairobi, and thank you very much for the support you gave. The highlight, the profiling of that summit was phenomenal, and we owe it to you, because you are the owners of uh, the instruments of visibility. Climate change and corruption today are national security threats. I have just left the Interior Ministry. The traditional threats of terrorism, organized crime like banditry and so forth, and trafficking in persons will continue to be there in the foreseeable future. But 
Additionally, in our national security priority list, corruption, because of the effect it has on economies and sustainability of the nation, and climate change are part of the national security matrix. And when I mean national security, I mean existential and survival uh, aspects of our country. The DNA of the world, including Kenya, is changing because of very, very, very hostile and brutal in, uh, effects of climate change. Severe droughts, severe floods, a displacement of populations and communities, resource conflicts, everything in between, even diseases. And therefore, good people, you are leading the way in integrating your profession to the science of climate change, and that is very commendable. And this country applauds you for what you've done. And really, if anybody had a doubt that the Kenyan media is a trailblazer and a thought leader for the region. And I dare say, we also compare very well even in the world. The kind of things Kenyan media and the does are not in so many democracies, as much as we have problems. In fact, the reason why the challenges we have get highlighted and we get angry when infractions are committed is because our country allows the visibility of those infractions and we have a very good media, a very good constitution, and I think we should all struggle to fit into the very, very, very good uh, example that you provided so that other sectors can follow suit. Those are my remarks uh, for today. I wish you all the best. Uh, I hope you said you're giving me the book or something. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. And uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for the park thing, the park and dinner something. The game drive, I really wish, I really wish, I really wish. I'm actually tempted to take the offer. So I wanted to <laughs> ask. <laughs> don't, 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 don't clap too soon. <laughs> I wanted to ask whether it is in order as a mitigating factor. Now that I'm not able to take the offer, whether a dinner tonight at the park can be on me. <laughs> so, Madam Bray, as many of that superior say hi, hi. the eyes have it. So, <laughs> there, are no, there are no contrary views. I really wish you the best. It's a beautiful county. DG, tell the governor we are happy that they are hosting us. You are hosting us here. We wish you well. Our guests and uh, friends of Kenya, the Chinese government representative, the British government representative, the partners who have supported our media to grow in leaps and bounds, Asanteni Sana, na mimi tunaomba tu tujaribu tu kuelewana kama wa Kenya, mahali matatizo yako, tuyatatue, ofisi ya rais, ofisi zote za serikali, ziko wazi, na you're free to contact us, even directly on what you think we need to do. So we need to look, Margaret, you need to, we need to agree with uh, this team. Uh, you need to agree with these colleagues on what they want. I heard them say there are things that they have challenges with in our proposals. Don't allow those proposals to go very far without having a sit down and conversing some of these issues. We might as well find out that uh, the issues are valid, and, and I suspect they are, and, and we should not be able to push through something that will hurt our, our colleagues in the media industry. So take it up. But I'm also taking up the other issues uh, on the pending bills, on the, on the board, and, and we'll work with you to make sure that we, when, the, when these friends invite us next year, they will not put us on the spot. Thank you.
Thank you, Your Excellency. We kindly request you to remain on the podium as I invite the President Cake to present the book to you. The President, the book is being handed over to you. Then you present it to the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. Let's appreciate her as she is handing over the book.